Okay, so uh, the question is, how do you fix a broken astronaut? And that's something that uh, NASA has been that's something NASA has been trying to solve for many years. And uh, I was lucky enough to be called upon to help them do it in uh, certain very diverse environments, such as Mount Everest, uh, under the sea, and in in the sky. Okay, this is Mount Everest, one of the harshest, most remote places on the planet. Uh, if you think about it, the summit is as high, it's at 29,035 feet, that's as high as transatlantic jets fly. And getting, getting to the top of Everest is, is no easy trick. You have to cross some incredibly deep crevasses, like 10 stories deep like this. Then you have to surmount I, the ice fall, 2,000 feet. And you go on across the uh, ice slopes, you have to traverse these enormous ice slopes, getting higher and higher in on oxygen. And finally, get near the summit. Uh, the summit is such a harsh, remote, uh, unforgiving place that the wind chill factor at the summit is actually lower than a summer day on Mars. <laughs> and uh, one of my, I've been there six times. One of my expeditions uh, was in 1996. Everest had the worst storm in its human history. And at that time, I was the only doctor on the mountain. The storm, uh, the storm lasted for two days. And during that time, I took care of the survivors, but eight people died up there uh, over those two days, just people we just couldn't save. And the reason we couldn't save them was because Everest is so, so remote near the summit that uh, the analogy was made that uh, being near the summit of Everest is like being on another planet. Uh, it's that remote and unreachable. Uh, that analogy wasn't lost on NASA. And uh, two years later, they invited me to go back to Everest with them uh, to try to test some equipment that they thought could be used in extremely harsh environments uh, for remote uh, sensing of astronauts. So at that time, there was a lot of uh, prototypes that we wanted to test. We put this stuff on the climbers, send them up the mountain, and then uh, monitor their progress. They had, we had sensors that they uh, that monitored their body temperature, they swallowed pills that broadcast their internal temperature, uh, all kinds of things, pulse rate, respiration, and they had GPS units on their heads so that we knew where they were at all times. And we'd monitor them from base camp, uh, taking in all the data, and uh, as well as that, we were doing our own testing uh, on, the, uh, on the climbers at base camp. And then we transmit all this data back to Yale University, where we held actually held grand rounds from 12,000 miles away. We were able to uh, t telemonitor the, uh, the climbers and send that information in real time back to the doctors at Yale. And we could call on any expert we wanted at Yale University to help us out. Uh, the doctors there say it was by far the best attended grand rounds they ever had. <laughs> okay, in addition to that, we also did some telecasts. Uh, from base camp, we were able to televise back to uh, TV shows in the United States. We did the first ever uh, live interview and broadcast with uh, Nightline. And then we did it with 60 Minutes and a few other news shows. Well, that worked out fairly well, uh, but there was still a lot more work to be done. The, uh, some of the equipment worked, some of it didn't. Uh, and NASA was very interested in making this stuff better and better. Uh, they wanted to upgrade these sensors and test them out in different environments. NASA has what they call space analogs. They go various places to simulate various aspects of what astronauts would encounter in outer space. Well, this is one of their analogs here. This is three miles off the coast of Key Largo, Florida. And uh, that's me about to dive with the Navy doctor. In the background is a support barge, which uh, brings life support systems down to this. This is called NEMO. It's uh, NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operation. What it is is a mock space capsule sitting on a reef in 63 feet of water, about the size and shape of a space station. And astronauts are brought down into this, where they live in group isolation for about two weeks. And during that time, they get used to what it's like to be in a, in a claustrophobic environment and, and a dangerous environment. Uh, and being underwater, they're neutrally buoyant when they scuba dive. So they come out every day and do the equivalent of spacewalks. Being neutrally buoyant, it does simulate weightlessness in many ways. So they practice the techniques they, that they need to build and maintain the International Space Station. And they also get a feeling for what it's like to work in reduced gravity. 
Here's an astronaut picking up a rock, and, and another one walking a, along of the, uh, the uh, seafloor, uh, all in a, in a state of reduced gravity, with weights on their backs to sort of judge what's the best way to carry a weight. And here's an astronaut just walking across the surface uh, as if he was walking across uh, reduced gravity on another planet. Okay, well the astronauts down, down in this capsule in 62 feet of water are nitrogen saturated. What that means is that they cannot just come back up to the surface. They would need 17 hours of decompression before they can come up. So if something goes wrong down there, they can't leave. They have to fix it. There's no other option. And this is very much what they would be like, uh, in what they might encounter on the International Space Station. They can't leave. So they have to be able to deal with any problem that arises. And uh, astronauts will tell you that psychologically, this comes the closest to what it's like to be on the space station. You're totally dependent on your technology. So this is a picture uh, taken from outside the capsule, looking in at astronaut uh, Nicole Stott, who's practicing a mock appendectomy. Because the question we're trying to answer is, what's the best way to deliver emergency medical care to astronauts on the space station or on another planet? Can an astronaut do it? Uh, do you need a doctor to do it? Or can you do it with a robot? Uh, so we have robots brought down into the capsule as well to try to make that work. Uh, the astronauts are controlled by doctors on planet Earth uh, remotely through, through televised cameras. They can either control the robot themselves or they can direct astronauts through, through that uh, system called te telemedicine. So we're testing all these things out. Uh, but at, at this point, the robots are only capable of doing very simple tasks, such as suturing. So uh, coincidentally, while I was there, uh, Nemo had their one and only true emergency. One of the astronauts cut his hand while he was down there. And uh, being that I'm a surgeon, and not only that, but a hand surgeon of all things, uh, <laughs> I was minding my own business on the surface, but they asked me if I would go down and take a look and uh, maybe you know, do what had to be done to fix this astronaut up. So uh, I dove back down, and here I am entering the capsule from underneath. The, the, the capsule is pressurized, so the, air, the water does not flow up into it. And there's a space there where you can sort of pop up from underneath. So here I am coming up underneath into the capsule. Uh, you see me here just popping up into what they call a moon pool. And when you get up into that, uh, there I was greeted by the astronauts above me, and I was instructed to take all my clothes off. <laughs> because uh, uh, humidity and moisture is a big problem in there, and they don't want anybody bringing anything moisture-laden, such as uh, gear or a wetsuit, into the capsule. So the instructions are to take everything off, and they give you a towel, and you, you come in just wearing the towel. <laughs> OK, this is what it looks like inside. It's a combination of a, a kitchen, uh, living quarters, and laboratory uh, technology, all rolled into one, astronauts relaxing inside. And this was my patient. It was astronaut Clay Anderson. His cut was really pretty minor, actually. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I probably could have covered this with steri strips, but, you know, given that the big deal involved here, I wanted to make as much out of it as I could. So, <laughs> so I decided that I really had to sew this guy up. <laughs> so here I am sewing him up. <laughs> this was. Uh, <laughs> It's a very routine operation, but it's the first time I've ever done surgery wearing only a towel. <laughs> well, surgery went pretty easily, and uh, here are the astronauts saying goodbye to me, giving me the thumbs up sign. One astronaut with his uh, thumb bandaged. And uh, as I left, they, uh, they said, stop by any time you're in the neighborhood. So uh, that was by far the, the greatest house call I've ever made. Nothing comes close to that. OK, but uh, working under sea does simulate space in, in many ways, but not really, uh, it doesn't really simulate weightlessness, because in the water, there's still friction. Even though you can move up and down effortlessly, there is friction uh, around you from the water. So to really get a, get a good test of what's going on in outer space, you need to go into weightlessness. So this is how NASA does it. They have what they call the vomit comet. And uh, it's named that for a good reason. Uh, 
This is the plate. It's a, C, it's a modified C9 that uh, takes off from Johnson uh, Space Center in Texas, flies out over the Gulf. It flies up to 32,000 feet and then nosedives down to, down to 24,000 feet. And uh, it does that over and over and over. Uh, the flight we took, we did it 60 times. And you can imagine what that's like to go up and down through this thing 60 times. Before they let you go on this thing, they give you lessons in how to vomit. Yet they show you how to use the bag because if you're not careful, you wind up with three-dimensional vomit all over the aircraft. So once you pass that test, they let you in the plane. And here it is in one of the dives. So this, this plane is just free falling for 30 seconds. It takes 30 seconds until the pilot uh, pulls out and does it again. So during that 30 seconds, men and machine inside are completely weightless. Anything that's not tied down just floats around the aircraft. So you can have the plane free fall. You can sort of dial up whatever amount of gravity you want. The plane can free fall, in which case you're totally weightless. Or you can ask the, the pilot to fly a parabolic curve, in which case they can simulate less gravity. You can just you sort of ask, you, you dial up what you want. You say to the pilot, I want moon gravity, I want Mars gravity, I want no gravity, and he'll fly the arc to, to make that happen. So here we are doing some testing in reduced gravity. And uh, here we are actually trying to figure out the best way uh, to do various tests, uh, to do various treatments to astronauts. It's as tricky as you think it might be, it's even trickier. Because when you're in weightlessness, there is absolutely no resistance to anything you do. It's, it's, it's so much not there that if you have a dial on a machine and you try to turn the dial, that resistance is too much. And the dial won't turn, and you will just turn around in, in the opposite direction. You go like this, and you just, you just go upside down all around. So you have to stabilize yourself at all times. Otherwise, you can't get anything done at all. You can imagine trying to do something like CPR in space. You push against somebody's chest, and the chest goes nowhere, and you go flying back across the entire airplane. And they have these million dollar robots and equipment in there, and you have no control over your motion. It's not like you're in water and you can sort of do this and slow yourself or change direction. There's no resistance whatsoever. So once you start moving, uh, your momentum will just carry you wherever it wants to go, and you're totally helpless to stop it. So you really have to be careful. One of the things we were testing is how to tie ourselves down. You can see me there. I have Velcro fasteners across my feet. Uh, that's one thing we were trying because uh, you want to keep your hands free if possible. So we're trying all these techniques. You have 30 seconds to do it, and then the, pi the pilot pulls out and comes up again, and then you have another 30 seconds. So we did it 60 times, trying various techniques to see what would be the best way to do surgery. OK, so here's a, uh, one, of the, one of the surgeons, one of the flight surgeon, uh, trying out some techniques. And there's a, an astronaut literally <laughs> looking over his shoulder, <laughs> <laughs> waiting his turn. Uh, when my turn came, it was, it's the greatest thing because when you're doing suture, you, you tie a knot and then you take the scissor, cut the knot, and then move on to the next one. But when you're in weightlessness, it's great because you can just you tie a knot, cut it, and then you just put the scissor like that, <laughs> and it stays there. <laughs> it's great. It's just wherever you want it, exactly where you want it, it'll stay if you don't give it any momentum. So you, you do that, you tie the knot, you cut it, you put the scissor back, you do the next knot, you take the scissor back. It's great. You can just... <laughs> uh, astronauts say when they're in space a long time, they get so used to that that when they go home, they pick up a cup of coffee or something and they just let it go. <laughs> and they don't realize that thing's going to drop. <laughs> get so used to it. It's easy to get used to. It's a lot of fun. Okay, so we were testing whether or not uh, this should be done by... Uh, by doctors or by astronauts. Could an astronaut really do this, you know, do some suturing, or do you need a doctor? Or can a robot do it? You know, maybe the best way is to teach a robot how to, how to do this kind of work to treat an emergency operation. So uh, we brought robots on with us as well. And then we had the uh, astronauts and the doctors remote controlling these robots uh, to see just how good we could do this kind of work. What we're primarily uh, doing was testing uh, this this uh, suturing technique, where we just took a plastic block, cut a, a slice into it as a make-believe laceration, and then we would try to sew it together. 
and we would try it ourselves. The doctors would try it, the astronauts would try it, and the robots would try it. And at the end, we actually took all these blocks and graded them to see who did the best job taking care of this stuff. So uh, the results were, uh, maybe not surprisingly, that the astronauts could sew just as well as the doctors. Uh, and it's not really that surprising when you think about it because uh, astronauts are smart, they're dexterous, they're motivated, and doing something like suturing is a pretty mechanical task. So uh, if it's a simple thing like suturing laceration, the astronauts are every bit as good as the doctors. But uh, when it comes to using judgment, that's where there's a huge difference. Like the astronauts will tell you, if it looks exactly like it does in the book, they're fine. But if it's, uh, if it's anything different than what they would expect, they have no judgment, they have no experience, they don't know what to do. So we found the best system was to have the astronauts actually doing the mechanical work and being monitored uh, back on Earth by doctors who could watch them on TV screens and actually guide them and tell them what they needed to do and uh, have the astronauts follow and make sure that they were doing what they wanted. So uh, the doctors and the astronauts did pretty well uh, and they both did better than the robots. The robots aren't really there yet. They're not, uh, they're not as good as humans uh, working in space. Okay, now hopefully this day is gonna come because uh, as you know, on Earth, a lot of surgery now is being done robotically. But one of the biggest problems we have on, on, uh, in space is that there's a huge time delay. Like if you want to do surgery on Mars, there's a 40 minute time delay in the signal. Far too long for any surgeon to work with uh, patients on Mars. So what has to be done is they're going to develop CAT scans to relay the information about the patient's condition back to Earth. Doctors on Earth are going to download this, program an operation, feed it into the computer, and then uh, send it back out into space where it will be downloaded, and then the robots can sort of make the operation happen like playing a tune on a player piano. So that's not there yet, but uh, that's going to be the next step. And that's where I'll leave you. Thank you.